Quite a little talk in testing the Henry Draper mirror and some testing history by Richard Parker. Uh, in June of 2010, Richard Parker, a member of the Springfield Telescope Makers, had the opportunity to test a 15 inch mirror made by Henry Draper in 1862. Uh, Draper was perhaps the first person in America to recognize the importance of the amateur in making telescopes and pioneered the development, not the invention of, uh, silver glass mirrors in the United States. This talk will show the results of the test of that mirror and outline the history of what was known, uh, what was the known technology for making and validating mirrors at that time. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dick Parker. Thank you very much. As I said in the intro, last year at this time, a little earlier in June, I had this wonderful opportunity to test this mirror. It was made around the time of the American Civil War, 1862. It was made by Dr. Henry Draper. So the first question is, who is Dr. Henry Draper? Well, he was a physician. He lived in New York, uh, a little north of New York City, in a town called Hastings on the Hudson. He had an observatory there. He was, I believe, one of, if not the first ATM in the United States. And the location at the Hastings of the Hudson is the location of his observatory, which is still there. It is now a, a museum for the Hastings Historical Society, which has a lot of the artifacts that Henry Draper uh, made. He made a 50 and a half inch Newtonian top style telescope. He then went on to make a 28 inch Cassegrain, the mirror of which is at Harvard, and then went on to pursue astrophotography. Remember, we're talking the American Civil War. Astrophotography and spectroscopy. His biographer spent an awful lot of time talking about the hundreds, if not thousands, of stars that he took spectrographs of his town. So he's a fairly, fairly prominent figure as far as an amateur in uh, telescope making and astronomy. So I had the opportunity to test the mirror for this 15 and a half inch telescope, or, or a mirror, let's say. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. This, uh, after I did the, uh, the test, I wrote a report, which I gave to the Historical Society. So if you go there, they will be able to show you the report. But it also has been published in the Antique Society, Telescope Society Journal, the current issue, number 33. So I'm very proud that it's there. But you can read about it here if you get a hold of an issue. Really, I'm just going to talk about four things. One is just simply the method of the test. Two, what our findings were, this is a factual description of what it is that we saw, give you some conclusions based on the facts, and you know, talk a little bit about the historical background of the analysis, because it's, I believe, pretty important as far as understanding where we put the conclusions that we found in the findings. So, a method of test, real simple. Most of you are ATMs here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. You're familiar with the focal light based test where you have a light at the center of curvature of an essentially spherical surface. The light goes to the surface and comes back. It'll come back to a point, and if you put your eye, if you move the light a little to one side of the axis and put your eye on the other, the whole mirror is going to, the whole optic is going to look as though it's uh, fully illuminated. And then if you cut it with a knife edge in front of where it comes to focus, you will see the appearance of a shadow coming across the face of the mirror in the direction that the knife edge is being introduced. If you put the knife edge behind the focus, the shadow will appear come, come from the opposite side. If you put the knife edge right at the focus point, the entire mirror will appear to darken and gray uniformly. I believe most of you know this. And part of the reason I'm introducing this is because this is the test that you used. If the mirror is not, if the wave front coming to, is not coming to a perfect focus, then what will show up? Since some rays are focusing behind and some rays are focusing head of focus, you'll get an appearance of shadows, and those shadows will show in relief uh, defects in the mirror. This one here essentially is a figure of revolution, but also any local uh, defects will show up too. Now later on, actually in 1920, there's a modification to that test with a Ronke screen. And a Ronke screen consists of a screen of uh, opaque and transparent, and opaque and transparent lines it's a very fine gradient, it's about 133 lines per inch. And if you shine the light, that it's a small light source, shine it through the screen on its way to the mirror and then have the reflected beam come back through the Ronke screen, 
on the way back, one of the, when you, you know, if you look at it a little ahead of or a little behind focus, what you'll see is the appearance of the, uh, the shadows of the bands on the face of the mirror. If uh, the wave front coming to a focus is spherical, then you get a, a null condition and the lines will be straight, parallel, and evenly spaced. Any waviness in the line indicates uh, roughness of the surface. Any curvature in the lines indicates that uh, um, figure of revolution, figure different than a sphere. And so with that, that's the test we use. Hopefully as it goes, as I go along, it'll be clear why we use the Ronke extreme. Uh, we did use some night bites test in combination with most of the Ronke, and I think it'll be clear as to why. Those participating in the test, of course, myself, I, uh, I am experienced in testing uh, mirrors. I was the one who had the test equipment. The test was conducted at the museum at the Hastings on the Hudson, and so I had to take the test equipment to the location. My good friend Alan Hall assisted me with this. He's an experienced ATM. He's also an experienced amateur telescope restorer. Another good friend of mine, Francis O'Reilly, he is uh, also an experienced ATM. He uh, lives near New York and was familiar with the Hastings Historical Society and knew that the mirror was there. So he was the one very instrumental in organizing this event to make sure that it could happen. And I certainly have, we all had the pleasure to meet Mark Free, who's a contributing historical researcher for the Antique Telescope Society. A very knowledgeable individual if you had never had a chance to meet him. It was our pleasure to have him there. I also want to make sure that I give thanks to the ladies of the Historical Society who took their time to open up the facility for us on a Saturday, which is an off day, specifically so we could come down and conduct this test. This was not a day open to the public. Uh, the ladies are Beth Smith, Erin Olson, Jane Gustafson, and Barbara Thompson. We thank them very, very much. This is a picture of Alan Hall. He's opening the box that has the mirror. You can see the mirror, of course, it's uh, wrapped in tissue. There's remnants of silver on it. Francis O'Reilly is standing in the background. The room that we used was the former observatory of Henry Draper. It was a round room that was probably about 20 feet in diameter. And that was not as big a room as we needed. It was the biggest room, but there was the radius of curvature in this is 304 inches. That was not long enough. Adjoining the observatory was a small room that was a library. So we put a table there and a work stand, and we set the mirror up on the work stand. I secured it with a couple of rubber bands. I absolutely wanted to make sure it didn't fall forward. And again, you can clearly see the remnants of the silver coating that is on the mirror. This, uh, and in the observatory itself, as far away as I could get, I put the table with the test apparatus on the wrong screen, and that's me making adjustments to the, to the screen and the light source. And this is a picture looking over Bart Free's shoulder. You can see across the room to the doorway, and you can see through the doorway is where the mirror was. And that's how we conducted the test. And the ladies from the Historical Society were very interested in what they were doing, and we tried to keep them as informed as best possible, and almost all of them had a chance to look through. It's a funny looking picture, and that light's a squiggle, because this was taken in the dark with a, a long exposure, and I was just hand holding the camera, but that's uh, Mary Wilson looking through the wrong screen. They were very interested to know that what they had really has some historical significance. So now, what did we find? So not just, what I'm going to try to just describe as factually as I can exactly what it is that we saw. Yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a curve to the mirror, and it came to a focus. We were able to make a test. We were able to get runchy lines out of it. They weren't perfectly straight and parallel, as I'll show you later on. But it certainly was consistent with the fact that this was intended to be an optic for a telescope. Uh, and, uh, but the remnants of the silver also gave us additional indications of that. The glass was 50 and a half inches in diameter and about an inch, a little, about a little less than an inch and an eighth thick. Basically a thin mirror, isn't it? By uh, standards we sometimes use now, our full thickness is six to one. We have thinner mirrors now, but back then, that was the best you could do. The radius of curvature was measured at 3 point, uh, 304 inches. That's F9.8. Fortunately, we have some writings from Dr. Henry Draper, which I'm going to discuss later, and he discusses a 50 and a half inch mirror, exactly this thickness, at F10. So, so far, we're pretty well on track. Outside of focus, the Ronke bands had a very obvious kink at the 70 cent zone, beyond which the bands tended to bow out. This was very obvious and very prominent. 
inside the 70% zone, the bands were essentially straight, but there was a little, with a little work with it, we could see a little bit of bowing consistent with an effort to uh, gravelize it, but they were very wavy, and I'll show you that in a minute. Overall, the Ronke pattern had a clock shift, so on one side of focus, they were oriented 11 to 5, and then when you go through focus to the other side, it was oriented 1 to 7. So this is a picture of the mirror on the stand with the Ronke bands. And all of the area is a little hard for, to see. The camera didn't pick it up as well as the eye does because that's the silver coated area. The rest of the mirror didn't have silver coating. So what I tried to do is use PowerPoint to superimpose what the Ronke bands actually looked like. Because I wanted to show you the fact that they were straight. It was a very obvious kink. Now you can probably see if you look through that. And there's a kink here, and there's definitely a kink there, and these are a little bit harder to see in the picture. I'll go, back, I'll go back one, just so now you can, now with the red lines missing, you can see those. Now if you back the screen away, it's a little less sensitive in, uh, as far as bigger revolution areas, but, errors, but what becomes a lot more obvious is the significant weightiness of the line. So, it, and then if you go through focus to the other side, now you can see that the lines are oriented the other way. One to, one to seven instead of 11 to five. So what do we make out of all of that? S the size and focal length is certainly consistent with his description. So this was probably made in conjunction with this 15 inch telescope that he made. Was it the mirror? Well, let's go on. The figure didn't appear, but you know, we all know, and with your telescope makers in better classes, you would look at that mirror and you say, you know, you gotta work on that mirror a little bit more. It doesn't appear to be what we would consider a particularly good optical figure. It was a, a zone at the 70% ZAM with the outer part of the mirror focusing long, in other words, turned down edge. The central portion was almost spherical because the lines were about straight. They were certainly wavy, so there was roughness in there. It was not smooth. Um, we had to kind of work this bronchi screen a little bit to try to pick up a general trend. The mirror had uh, a the clock shift going through focus indicates astigmatism. Stigmatism is uh, when that's a thin mirror. I think I'll talk a little bit more about that later for the historical background. But we did try several different orientations. We tried removing one of the rubber bands to see if it would make a difference. Yes, there was some difference with uh, the rubber band, one of the rubber bands off, so there's a contribution to that. There was also contributions to the way it was oriented, etc. When I looked at this and then read his paper, it was my conclusion that this mirror was probably not the one that ended up in his finished 15 inch telescope. Will we ever know for sure? I don't know. But based on the available information, it just doesn't seem to match certain things. And that's what I want to really go over with you now. Does it make it any less historically significant? I don't think so. In fact, I think it's terribly historically significant. And now I'm going to talk about, I've just taken about 10 minutes to give you a pretty quick overview of any mirror that you probably test. You say, well, what's so big about that? Well, now I'm going to talk about the history. Because I want to try to put into perspective, should he have been able to do better? We often tend to think, well, what did they know in 1860? We're smarter than that now. We can make mirrors a lot better than that now. I'm not sure that's entirely true. Let me just try to give you an idea. The first thing we had going for us is we had uh, Francis O'Reilly found this document that Henry Draper himself wrote. This is his document on the construction of a silver glass telescope 15 and a half inches in diameter and its use of celestial photography. We had this document, fortunately, which was his own description of what he tried to do and what he achieved and how he achieved it. So this was a, a very important find. Now, let's just take a moment to think about what's happened. We're, looking, we're talking 1862 is when he made the mirror. At least that's when he started it. Finished it about 1863 or 64. At that time, mirrors were being made out of speculum. They weren't necessarily being made out of silver glass. But the idea of a silver glass mirror, people knew about it. It had been tried, but the process wasn't really developed. Opal had tried it. Harry had tried it. In fact, uh, Dr. Henry Draper designed, first tried to make a specular mirror. He made a trip in 1857 over to visit Lord Ross. We're all familiar with the Leviathan telescope. And he spent a year there 
trying to understand how to make specular mirrors so he could come back to the United States and bring that technology back and make a mirror. And he started to make a specular mirror. But during the winter, some water got in the speculum and cracked it and broke it. And he said, I need another plan here. So his father John went over and visited one of the Herschels who said, you know, how about silver glass? Brought that information back to Henry and he said, hmm, let me do this. So we're now at the infancy of making silver glass mirror, although I didn't even try. He made three mirrors to do this. And he says, write in his papers, I'm going to make three. Well, chances are, if I only make two, I won't be able to tell the two apart. But somewhere, if I make three, one of them will bubble up as clearly being the best. So he made three with the intention that the best one would end up in a telescope. And all three were silver. So the idea of saying, well, this had to be the one in the telescope because it was silver, uh -huh. he tested all, he still all three. He was also very experienced, having made a hundred optics. Some of them small, but some of them large. How many of you have made a hundred optics? hundred optics is a lot. That's no insignificant experience. The man knew what he was doing. And the glass was used in the ship for ship's skylights, portholes. How many of you think, well, in the 70s, the idea, ah, oh, we're going to use portholes. <laughs> Guess what? This idea was around from the get-go, as far as American telescope making is concerned. We gotta discuss astigmatism just a little bit because he placed a great deal of importance to that. The glass at the time was made by a rolled process. It was not made by a float process. Which meant that the glass would tend to bend easier in one direction than in another. And he spends a great deal of time talking about the testing in the various different orientations so you identify the, the, the amount of the mirror in the stiff-wise way so that it won't bend. If you found it the wrong way, it'll easily flop over it. It'll influence your test, and it'll also influence the performance in the telescope. And a little-known bit that also he talked about, you know, refractors, and people always talk about how you index the two pieces of glass, then you get better performance. The reason is because the optical glass for the refractors back at that time was also made for the roll process, and it bent easier in one direction than another. So the whole idea of I keeping those optics oriented was to keep the easy line bending in the right direction, even went so far as one telescope in England had a lens mounted in a cell, a whole cell could rotate, and it had a mark on the bottom, so wherever they pointed the telescope in the sky, they could rotate the lens and keep the, the, or, the proper orientation side on top. So he was pretty into what he was doing here. Now at the time, they did test mirrors a little differently than we do now. They accept this criteria is based on the image of a star. We all know that the star has a, a disk of finite size and rings. They've known this for a long time. They didn't know why at first, but they did know it. They knew opticians for a hundred years had known what a properly focused star would look like. So the fact that we know today isn't any different than what they do in 1860 or even 18 or even before that. Now George Airy published his edulatory theory of light about 1831. In that paper, he then explains how light has properties of a wave and could come up with the mathematics to explain this phenomenon as a result of diffraction. But the phenomenon was known. But George Airy explained why. 30 years before Henry Draper made his mirror, which was in 1860. So that was not only known by Draper, it was also known by Foucault. They also understood the, the caustic. They knew what spherical aberration was. They knew that if you had a spherical surface subject to parallel light coming in, that the rays from the center of the mirror uh, are going to focus shorter than the rays from the uh, edge of the mirror and the rest of the rays in the intermediate zones are falling between and that was what they called the caustic. They knew this. And they knew that's what the star test meant. And they knew that if you defocus the star on one side and defocus the star on the other, if you didn't get equal images, your spherical aberration was not corrected. So they didn't know. We don't know anything more about them, that now than what they knew tested for it in a different way. The diffraction theory of light was in uh, 1831. Okay, Leon Foucault and his bench test in 1859. This is now, he published that about three years before Henry Draper made his mirror. Now I want to talk about this just a little bit because I think it's very important. First of all, 
Henry Draper speaks English. Leon Fogel spoke French. Henry Draper's paper has six pages devoted to the testing of mirrors using the Fogel method. I don't know who was the first person to translate Fogel's work from French into English, but it could have been Henry Draper had that done. He had a need to know, and he made sure that it was done. He even used many of the diagrams that were in Fogel's paper. Now we all know that Fogel came up with the shadows with the knife edge. Fogel had three ways of examining. He came up with a point source of light so he could do the bench test and not rely on a star. But now, he had three ways of examining that return image. One was with an eyepiece. And you would look at it and you would see the, diffra the diffraction ring and you'd be able to do the inside and outside of focus just as we do a star test. And you would know when you had reached the focus point. He also used a grid. Similar to a Romji screen of parallel lines, he had a grid of horizontal and vertical lines. And what he looked for was distortions in the squares very similar to the Ronke test that we now know today. And he also had the knife edge test with the shadows. But do you know how he parabolized the mirror? He did not parabolize the mirror by measuring zones. He parabolized the mirror by melding to a sphere. Then he would move the light closer to the mirror and the knife edge further away and null to an ellipse. When he got that null done, he would then move the light closer the night edge farther away, he would know to another ellipse. And he would go through that five or ten times until he ran out of room in his workshop. Then he would run some calculations, figure it a little bit more, and then test it in a telescope. Volpa did not measure by testing zones. You want to know who was the first person to figure out how to measure with zones? It was Henry Draper. He knew that with a focal length or a radio center of curvature of 304 inches, there was no way in order. He would need a shot to go into the successive series of ellipses. He would need an awfully big shot, which he didn't have. So he sat down and figured out the predictability that when you're, comparing, you're making a mirror and you're parabolizing, you're comparing, comparing the parabola to a sphere, and you can predict where the center zone is going to focus, where the edge zone and the middle zones are going to focus, and where the edge zones. And he called it parabolizing by measure. And he had the mathematics in his paper. He was the first one to do this, I think, at least write it up, that you could actually measure these zones. He was the one who, he also calculated the sensitivity, what, how good this test probably is. And he also recognized that the downfall of the whole test was understanding what the zones were. This is in 1862. So now, also, he did it a little bit differently when he measured the zones. He didn't do it by nulling out the, the zones with the knife edge. What he did was make masks. He made a mask for the center of the mirror. He made a mask that exposed the middle part of the 70% zone of the mirror. And he made a mask that exposed the edge. And he determined the focal point of those using the eyepiece. It was Richie who actually came up with the, the ring zones from the knife edge test that we know. But still, to figure out, to understand, to know so much about it that he figured that he could paralyze by measure and come up with that method and write about it, I think was pretty amazing. So, let's talk about Lord Rayleigh. He did not write his uh, quarter wave tolerance until about 1879. That was a little bit later, but do we need the Rayleigh criteria to make a good mirror? Maybe not. The Rayleigh criteria basically says that if the optical path difference is less than a quarter of a wave, then you start to see some degradation. Now, if you're making mirrors for sale, you know, this is a, is a glass half full or glass half empty question. If I'm making mirrors for sale, I could work forever to try to get to perfection, but now that I have a criteria, I don't need to go that far. I can spend less time in the mirror, sell it, or lens or whatever we're making, sell it and go make the next one. But Henry Draper was not making telescope mirrors for sale. He was a scientist, an amateur. He wanted the best mirror he could possibly make. He had no reason to stop at a quarter wave. He could go until that star image was right either side. He could, but he could. That's the point. They just want to make sure we understand not having a Rayleigh limit doesn't mean you couldn't make us with a telescope. That was the argument that I wanted to show. His mirrors were long. They were not difficult to paralyze. Pretty much test like a sphere. That's an F4. You know that if you are nulling the 70% zone in an F4, the inside and the outside are so far away from null, it's hard to see any other surface defects. But when you're looking at 
something like an F7 or an F8, you've got an awful lot more subtlety to the crackle oil donut. You actually do have a little bit better shadowing, and you probably know from your own testing that you would see local defects, at least in the magnitude that we saw. We have no reason to believe you would not have seen the roughness, the waviness in the zone. Now just to give you an idea, this is an 8-inch F8, it's a parabola. The correction is about a third of a wave to get up from a sphere to a parabola. And if you do a crude arithmetic, a 15-inch F10 is about the same, so rocky lines ought to look about like that. And clearly they didn't. They're just a very gentle curve to them. And if I remember I said there was a kink and then the outer side was turned out, if I'm looking at the inside, 70%, you can see the lines would be pretty straight with just a very gentle curve suggesting parabola. So that's really what we saw if you, if you try to filter out the waviness. So he had, uh, he had knowledge and tests and so on, the same that we had available today. Uh, and I want to test, we'll talk also a little bit here about polishing machines, because in his paper he describes extensive use of polishing machines. He made several, that's a diagram of one of them, that's a diagram of another. And he spent a lot of time polishing his mirrors, documenting the process, and trying to come up with one that would give him a good parabola. He couldn't really do it until later when he finally made his last machine. But the other ones kept giving him a zone and a turned down edge that he could never get rid of. Sound familiar? And he described that. Now, the other little tip, okay, this is how he powered his machines, by the way. Remember, we didn't have electricity back then. This is a treadmill that you put a sheep or a dog or anything to walk on and turn the wheel and then it powers the machine. And this I thought was cute. I knew you all had to see this. This is in his paper, an ordinary barrel, walking around the barrel to make a mirror. 1864. This stuff didn't come out in the 50s and so on. Right away from the very first ATM walking around the battle. Finally, he describes what he saw through his telescope in good detail. And it takes a very good optic to see the detail that he uh, talked about. He talked about splitting the gamma and Andromeda BC pair. Now today, they're down, down here, very close together, so if you try to split them with your telescope, you're probably not going to, but back in 1860, this is at a Burning Celestial Handbook, they were about 0.5 seconds arc. The theoretical re resolving limit for a 50-inch telescope is 0.38, so he's able to resolve an equal brightness pair that's not too far away from the actual limit of the telescope. And I, I just believe the mirror that I saw and tested most probably would not have been good enough to do this. It would have scattered enough light that you might not have been able to see it. He also talks about seeing the companions of Sirius, which had only been recently discovered by the Clarks in making an 18-inch refractor. And one of his biographers described the fact that he heard about the separation, heard about Henry Draper separating, went to Harvard and looked at the 15-inch refractor there, which was a Clark refractor, and he was able to resolve the, uh, the split the companion of Cirrus. So we're looking now at resolving a companion to Cirrus that they took the best telescopes of the day in order to resolve. So I think that speaks well. He also describes Jupiter as bands from pole to pole with swirl. The moons were clear discs that could easily be seen. So he obviously had a pretty good mirror. There was one last thing that he described that he also tried masking the outer part of the mirror because if he knew that he had a turned down edge and masked the outside of the mirror and the, mirror, the image improved that the mirror would have turned down edge. He did that and saw no difference. The mirror that we tested definitely had the, the turned down edge. So it seems more probable to me that this mirror, it fits the description of the trials that he had where he, with his machines, that he was not able to get it. He, he then went off to fight the war, by the way, and then went off to fight the Civil War, and came back about a year later and took this mirror that was the best one, took it back out of the telescope, refigured it. He described it, and this is the best we know how to make. We mean the collective world of the knowledge that we have. So I think what we have is a very interesting historical mirror because it does show that this is, you know, certainly something that had been tried. Uh, it was part of this process. He was a very important amateur. And I've got to show you a couple of interesting tidbits. This is probably something. This picture here, to me, was a slap in the forehead, jaw-dropping. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if you see what you see that I see in there, but I'm going to blow this picture off you. 
This is a picture that he drew in his thing showing the mirror mounted in the telescope. He was aware that it was a thin mirror. He was aware it was going to flex. He was aware he needed to mount it on a flotation cell. He made an inner tube out of rubber, which he inflated. Here's the valve, a tire valve. Here is the chain and sling to hold it. Here are the three hooks to keep it from falling forward. If you think that came from the 1970s, guess what? Henry Draper, and he by a hundred years, I thought, wow, that is pretty interesting. This man knew what he was doing. He wasn't just some guy fooling around in the basement. Now I'm gonna show you the last slide. I hope I don't get stoned. You're probably gonna throw me out of a room. I'm gonna show you the slide anyway. This is his, in his opening paragraph. I'm going to read it to you. I can see no reason why silver glass instruments should not come into general use among amateurs. The future hopes of astronomy lie in the multitude of observers and in the concentration of the actions of many minds. If what is written here should aid in the advance of that noble study, I shall feel amply repaid for my labor. Here was the first man who had the vision we need to get amateurs making telescopes, and I'm going to write an instruction book on how to do it. Back in 1864. Unfortunately, he didn't have the publicity of a magazine publisher to get his stuff well known. He published this at the Smithsonian Institute. That went over to Europe. People read it voraciously when they got it, but they had to get copies from one another. So Henry Draper is very important. He's probably one of the first ATMs, and his ATMs are self we certainly ought to recognize his contribution to the ATM world. That's what I have. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it. Question? Well, a lot of what, yeah, the question was, he died a very young man, and that's true. He died about 1822, or 1882, was about 45 years old. Um, and did he, did anybody teach him this? Um, he, in 1857, he went over to Ireland and had a visit with Lord Ross. He spent a year over right there. And Lord Ross, I think, told him how to do it. The rest of it, he had a copy. And now, remember, the Fogel's paper, by the way, the Nightmare's Pest that we know about, is a long paper on the construction of a silver glass mirror. So in addition to the little testing bit that we know, there's a whole lot of other instruction on how to make, how to polish, how to figure, how to test mirrors. So he was largely self-taught. 